So section 3.3 is going to talk about measures of standing and relative position. So if, if you're a piece of data in this data set, how do you compare it to other ones? How is your position or your rank going to compare to other ones? Now we already do have a one term for some of this stuff and it's exactly what's in the middle of your data set. What's our name for what's in the middle of a data set? Median. So this is if you order your data set and you look at the, the number that splits your data exactly in half, half your data is above, half your data is below. But we can split those again, here and here. I'm going to call this one Q1. That's your first quartile. It separates the bottom 25% of the data from the top 75% of the data. And then there's Q2. What's another word for Q2, do you think? The median. The median. Q2 and the median are exactly the same. Now you've got a total of three quartiles that, that separate your data into four different slots. So again, each of these has 25% of the data. So those are your quartiles. Let's see if we can't find some quartiles for a particular data set. So hopefully you've got the data for section 3.3 opened up. The easy way to find the minimum, especially if your data is not sorted, is just to ask for exactly that. Now the commands here that you're going to use are in green. Keep in mind you always got to type the equals for that, so it equals min. And then you can click and drag. But if you end up having to do that for a lot of data sets, then you might want to start taking note of the range here, B1 to B50. So that's the minimum. If I want the first quartile, well, that command is kind of already here for you. It's quartile, you got to tell the data range, and then which quartile you want. So the data range, then a comma, and either a one, two, or three, depending on if you want the first, second, or third quartile. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste it down here with quartile three, but I don't want the first quartile again. I want the third quartile. So what kind of a change am I going to make to this? With the two? I want the third quartile. So, so three. yeah, three. Beautiful. And if you wanted to here, we could paste again and change that to a two to get the second quartile. So great, you got the first, second, and third quartiles. That's fine. Uh, you can do the maximum as well. Now the reason I'm, I'm showing you those things is because this is gonna be part of what's called the five number summary. I don't wanna click and drag. I already know that's B1 to B50. So I'll just do the maximum there. It's great, and I'm gonna make that a little bit cleaner uh, here. Let's make those all centered, so beautiful. So these are the five numbers that I want you to be able to find here. You got your max, your min, and the three quartiles. Those numbers, like I said, are going to help us find something called a box plot, which we're going to do in a minute. But are we okay finding the quartiles? Is that part okay? We'll practice that again with example B. Um, but we don't have to stop in dividing things down into quarters. We can go further. If you think about um, some of the word, it's quartile, quart, fourth, but we can go down to deciles, deca, deci, tenth, ten. There's ten deciles. I'm not going to deal with deciles. Let's go to the last one in the, the chain of fractiles, which would be uh, percentiles. So quartiles divide up the data into quarters. Percentiles divide up the data into how many slots, would you think? Cent. Think about it. Hundreds. Yeah. 
it's going to divide it up into 100 slots. So you have 99 percentiles that will divide up your data into 100 slots. Just like you have three quartiles that divided data up into four slots. If you wanted to find those percentiles, you could. So let's take a, a quick look at a couple of examples here. For instance, with data set uh, in example A, if I want to find the 11th percentile, here's the command. Now, if you look this up on Google Sheets, the funny thing is it doesn't come up first on your Googling of Google Sheets. But I've actually edited the command a little bit to be a little more specific. You've got to type in your data range and then the percent as a decimal. So it's going to look like this equals percentile. And make sure you don't do percent if you want percentile. Choose the right one. I always press the tab key. Where's my data for this example? B1 to B50, so let's type in those. Then a comma. And now you've got to type in this percentage as a decimal. So 11% as a decimal, what would that be? So 0.11. But you've got to type that in as a decimal. If you type in 11, Google Sheets is going to bark at you. It's going to say, no, I don't understand this. So you're going to get an error. But if you type in the 11th percentile, you should get 0.6. Try that again and try and find the 28th percentile. So if you need to see it again, here's my calculation of the 11th percentile. Make sure you get that, then go to try and find the, um, the 28th percentile. Guys, getting these, Rianne, what'd you get? All right, so I'm just going to copy this command here down to here, and all I have to do is edit this to get the 28th percentile. So I'll put in a 0.28, and I get exactly what Rianne got. Nice, thank you. You could ask things the other way around. It's like, all right, if my score is 8.6, what's my percentile? And before we consider that, let's look back at what we've got here and write in some percentiles. Q1 would be the 25th percentile. That separates the bottom 25% from the top 75%. What do you think the percentile would be for the median? What would I write here? P50, good. And the last one over here? 75. 75. Dylan, that sounded like you. Thank you so much. So, nice. Nice. If you wanted to figure out well, what percentile something is, then you could do that. So the command is percent rank. So you type in your data range and then the value of your data. So if I want to find the percentage rank for 8.6, I can do that. It's equals percent rank. And as soon as it recognizes your data, that's it. Now, as a reminder, you can always click and drag or you can type in that data. But once you've typed that in, you got to follow that with a command or you've got to follow with a comma and then the value that you want. Uh, I don't want this. I don't know why it's giving me this. Uh, let's see. 50. There we go. So a comma and then 8.4 was that value that I wanted. So 8.6. 8 .6? Okay. Thank you. 8.6. 8.6. And hold my breath. Are you guys getting that? 0.755. So it's a 75.5th percentile. What that's saying is that it's 
bigger than 75.5% of the data and smaller than 24.5%. So that's, that's its rank. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to ask you that you calculate these kinds of things by hand. I am going to ask that you know the difference in a couple of values, and I'll illustrate it this way. Um, let's see. I think I'll let you know that over the weekend I was going to do a race, and in my age group over the weekend, I finished in the 30th percentile. Now I compared my time to a race that I usually do, same distance, uh, just different venue, and in that race I would have finished in the 75th percentile. Which one is better in terms of your finishing place for such a race? Which one would you rather have? Now answer that question for yourself silently for a moment. Think about it. Then we're going to come back and talk to our neighbors about it. So which one is better? Assuming you want to do well. Would you be happier in the 30th percentile or the 75th percentile? So this is the kind of thing that I want you to know for percentiles. Which one is better? All right, talk to your neighbor. Which one do you like better? Would you rather finish in the 30th percentile or think about it as your ACT score? Do you want to be in the 30th percentile for your ACT score or your SAT? Or do you want to be in the 75th percentile? Which one? <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking. You're thinking. Thank you. Kate went out. I was the last one. I was really lost in thought. You you look like your head was buried in your desk. Yes. I. It's all the I was spiraling with all these nuggets in my head. Trying to calculate. All right. So we reached the consensus yet. Kata, it doesn't look like you have anyone to, to chat with. Um, so what are your thoughts? Uh, which one's better if you want to finish, you know, pretty strong? If you want to finish in the 30th percentile or the uh, 75th percentile? Which one's better? 75th. 75th? I vote for 75th. Couple. Maddie, what do you think? 75th. 75th? Wow. Either I did a better job of explaining this or I have to wear glasses when I teach this class because you guys are really bright, right? Um, nice. Anyways, uh, yeah. There was a little more division in my morning class. But the 30th percentile means you're better than 30%, but not as good as 70%. Whereas the 75th percentile, all right, yeah, you're doing pretty good there. So, nice. Now, I almost put this question on your quiz today, but I didn't. Is, uh, excuse me, are the people that sign up for this race, is that a random selection of people or is that a voluntary response? Voluntary. So you can't really generalize much out of the results of this race other than that's who you beat or didn't beat you that day. So 70th, 75th percentile versus 30th percentile. Now, a number of years ago, I did a half Ironman triathlon. And at the time, uh, it was a really tough race because it was really hot. 20% of the people dropped out. I finished, but just barely. I, I, I was, my position relative to the pack wasn't very good. But the, my friends around me weren't the kind of understanding, kind of, oh, good job finishing, you know, way to go, kind of friends. They are more like, you did what? So when they asked me how I did, I told them very honestly, hey, I finished in the 10th percentile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're like, whoa, wow, that's pretty good. But what mistake were they making? They're confusing the 10th percentile with what? The 90th percentile. So 
that's the kind of thing that I want you to understand is what's the difference? You know, it's, it's not my fault that they don't understand statistics. I literally told them exactly how I finished. If they misinterpreted it, it's on them, not me. In any case, watch and understand the difference between those kind of things. Okay, Georges? Just nod and say yes. Good job. Thank you. All right. Um, some of these numbers that we're getting, they're going to be part of something called a box plot. So let me talk to you about what a box plot is, and then we'll do one for example B. So a box plot is a nice thing. It's also called, so we can do AKA five number summary. So it goes by both of those names. First of all, I'm gonna draw a little rectangle here. It's gonna be the box and shoulders. I like to call them box and whisker plots. I think you'll see why in just a moment. So something like this. It's just kind of a clever way and a quick way to summarize your data into a five number summary. So you have these lines coming out from the box, either direction, left and to the right. This one over here at the very left end is your minimum. And then this is Q1, that's Q2, that's Q3, and the last one's the maximum. So it's just a very quick summary of your data. It kind of gives you a feel for how spread out the data is. You could look at various box plots and you know see what you think, how spread out or is it not. Is it skewed one way? Is it skewed the other? So let's do a box plot for example B. So go back to Google Sheets and click example B. You need to find all this information down here. Now I started you out with a minimum. I think you can just eyeball the maximum, right? Maximum would be eight. But find Q1, Q2, and Q3. There's really three different commands you can use to find Q2. One is to find Q2. The other one is to find median. What would be the third way you could find Q2? Hmm, gonna have to think on that one.
how are we looking with our five number summaries? Most. You know, some people have problems. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't use the guest Wi-Fi in any case. Um, all right. So your five number summary should look like this. The minimum is at one. The maximum is at eight. Find Q1, Q2, and Q3. So those are all pretty good. Let's write down that summary. So we've got uh, the min was at one. Uh, the maximum was at eight. Uh, min, Q1, Q2, Q3, and max one. And then the values in between were 3.5, Four and five point five. So let's draw our, our box and whisker plot. So we'll start with the shoulders. That's going to be between three point five and five point five. So here and here, and has a median there. Just let me scratch one out. Got some whiskers that go to the maximum and the minimum. So here and here. There. There's your box and whisker plot. It's kind of nice. It gives you a feel for your data, how spread out it is. You've got what's called the interquartile range. It's kind of a fancy term here. Uh, inter quartile range. That's going to be Q3 minus Q1, that distance. I'm not sure if that'll come up at any point. Certainly it's not a quiz item for me, but in case it shows up on the homework, at least you've seen it. It's in the notes. It's on the video. But let's do some more work with uh, standard deviation and measures, res uh, measures of position. So let's see, here, um, one way that I can ask questions on an exam, or you'll see this on the homework, is for you to take a data set and then figure out which one of these diagrams actually matches the box plot for that data set. And that's not a big deal, you're just going to find that five number summary and match it up. This is more of a Jeff question, though. I like this one. This one, there's no calculation. It's just asking you, do you understand what's going on here? And this is going to pair things up with stuff that we did in the last section. And the question is, which one of these data sets has the largest standard deviation? And that's a good question. Because it's asking you to look at it and interpret box plots, but it's also asking you, do you understand standard deviation from the last section. So it's kind of nice that the ancillary benefit is that it's showing you a symmetric distribution, a right skew distribution, and a left skew distribution. Remind me, how do you tell if something is 
skewed right or skewed left, what determines which direction is it skewed? The tail. The tail. Yeah, the direction of the tail. And here you can see that the, the tail is bigger on the right than it is on the left, and over here, the opposite. But which one of these has the largest standard deviation? The left skewed. Got to vote for the left skewed? But I'm not seeing too much certainty. Yeah. I'll vote for the left skewed. Left skewed? Okay. So two for the left skewed. Rain, same thing? Yeah. Left skewed. Why? Why the left skewed? It's more spread it's out. Larger. It's more spread out. Beautiful. That's that's perfect. That I would accept that, Hudson, as an answer on a test. It's more spread out. That's what the standard deviation measures is how spread out the data is. And you're seeing right there in the form of a box plot, yeah, this one is more spread out. So, nice. Uh, let's move down to example D. And we're going to do something else to our little list here. It's something called a Z-score. So let me talk about Z-scores. Um, Z-scores. These are another way to gauge your position within a data set. So a z-score is your data value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Now I'm not going to write it like that like ever again. It's going to depend if you're working with a sample or a population. The calculation is going to be the same, but the notation is going to look different. If you're dealing with sample data, then your data value is just x. Same thing here. Data value is going to be x either way. What's the notation that we use for the sample mean? Does anyone remember? It would be x bar. That's your sample mean. For population, we use this Greek letter, it's called mu. And if you're curious, anyone out there still plays words with friends, mu is a legitimate word in words with friends, mu. So if you want a two letter word that ends in u, there it is, mu and nu, both Greek letters. How about the standard deviation? Uh, to hard, do you remember our notation for the standard deviation? Um, wait, no, you said the, the standard just, just, yeah, just the standard deviation. S? S, well done. And likewise over here, for our population standard deviation, it's sigma. It's still the same thing. You're still doing the data minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. The only thing is, on the one hand, you've got population data. On the other hand, you have sample data. It's the same calculation. But let's look at this for example D. So we've got actors and actress. And even though they mentioned in the problem, they're talking about the Academy Awards. In a recent awards ceremony, the age winner of Best Actor was 41, and the age winner of Best Actress was 57. So that's your X values. So X here was 41. X here was 57. Let's write down some more information. For all best actors, the mean age is 46.4 and the standard deviation is 5.4 years. Okay, so X bar for this data set is 46.4 and the standard deviation is 5.4. For best actress, those data values are X bar is 38.4 and S is 50, no, excuse me, S is 11.11, 11.1. .11. Okay. 
Great. Let's do a little calculation for some z-scores and try and compare these things on z-scores. Now, relative to their own data sets, you've got different means and different standard deviations. But when you standardize things by calculating a z-score, you can now compare these things and find out which one's more extreme relative to your data set. So let's take a look at actors. To calculate the z-score there, that's going to be x, which is 41. 41 minus 46.4 divided by 5.4, and that works out to a nice even negative 1. How about actresses? Let's work on that one. So, actresses. So that's going to be another Z calculation. Z equals bless you. Thank you. 57 minus 38.4 divided by 11.1. Now, in long-standing tradition, I'm going to round these to the nearest hundredth, um, typically speaking. Actually, here I'll give you an extra decimal point. Do be careful a little bit when you calculate this. The way you type this in, if you type it in like this, uh, let's see, where is it? 57 minus 38.4 and then divided by 11.11 or 11.1, you're not going to get what you're hoping you're going to get. It's something like this. What's wrong? What did I do wrong in calculating what you this? What you're calculating it's going to do. Divide the 38 by 11 first. Yeah. To make to make sure that it does the numerator, the subtraction first, you need to put parentheses around that. So let me go back up here, grab that calculation, and redo it. So I'll put in a parenthesis here, and I need to put in another parenthesis here. So insert there. And now it should get a little bit 1.68-ish. There you go, 1.675, 1.676. So 1.676, we'll call it. That's an approximation. But here's what you're getting. This is counting how many standard deviations away you are from the mean. So which one is farther from the mean, the actors or actresses? Actors. Actresses, you're farther away from mean. You're 1.6, you know, you're, you're closer to two standard deviations away from the mean here than you are here. Um, here, you're just one standard deviation away from the mean. But what is that negative telling me? That negative is, is telling me something. It's just not how far away, but it's telling me something different. What's the negative saying here in this calculation? That it's lower than the mean. Perfect. Thank you, Haley. So you're, you're below the mean. That's what the negative says, is that you're below the mean. So I was talking to my morning class, and I said that on average, you know, a typical summer in Michigan has about 15, 15 days above 90 degrees in temperature. Um, I don't know what the standard deviation would be, but if I ask you to calculate the z-score for this, do you think we get a positive or negative z-score for this summer? Have there been a lot of really hot days this summer, or has it been pretty nice? Pretty nice. X is about 3. 3 minus 15. Standard deviation is always positive, so you're going to get a negative z-score if you did this calculation. And the thing that I want to enforce on you or impress upon you is that a negative z-score simply means you're below the mean as opposed to being above the mean. So it's a measure of position and how far away from the mean you are. <clears throat> 
um, you can you can start to identify values that are significant, significantly high, or significantly low based on the author's rule of the range rule of thumb. If you're more than two standard deviations away from the mean, that's the point at which you start to say, you know what, that's significantly higher. Or if you're two standard deviations below the mean, then you're significantly lower. Values in between that are not significant in the author's humble opinion. Um, last but not least, suppose that I calculated the z-score for, for you on your next statistics test. Which z-score would you want and why? Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2? Two. 2. What's that saying? Better than yeah, your two standard deviations higher than the mean. What is the z-score of zero saying? No, you see, you're exactly average. You're right at the mean. So, perfect, perfect. All right, that's it for section three point three.